All right, so we're going to pick up, as I said, where we left off, and we're going to finish up what we call the as-is value of Google. So in order to do that, we're going to go back to the Assumptions tab, and we're going to add in four new assumptions. <clears throat> we're going to add in an assumption for Sales 1, which is the first forward year. That's the convention. Sales 2, which is the second forward year. We're going to do the same thing for operating profit one and operating profit two. Okay. So these are going to be the first two forward years, year one forward, year two forward, for sales or revenue and for operating profit, a.k.a. EBIT, or operating income of the firm. And as I said, we're going to go to Bloomberg, and on the EEO screen, make sure you have annualized data, not quarterly data. Annualized data, we're going to use this data. All right. So right now, I'm going to take a screenshot. Google, what is this? Google DES, EEO, EEO. Save, replace. Oh, well, update the exact screenshots we're using in the video online. You'll see these. Because right. they can change at any time. <clears throat> Matter of fact, you can see some of the changes with the arrows. There's been some upward revisions in Google's operating profit for 2015 and 2016 recently. Right. Looks like one of the three analysts changed it. But anyways, back to this. For 2013, 47,446. So we're going to come to our model. I'm going to put in 47,446. And for sales 2, which is 2014, 55,299. 55,299. For the operating profit, you'll notice that the analysts forecast both an operating profit and an EBIT. And they're virtually the same number. EBIT is earnings before interest and tax. And typically, non-operating items are an EBIT. But every now and then, there could be but it's not really typical. But you'll also notice that 34 analysts are predicting operating profit, only nine are predicting EBIT. So operating profit is a more well-forecasted number. So in our model, we're, we're actually using EBIT, and what we're going to do is we're going to use the forecast for operating profit as our EBIT, because we're not having any non-operating items above our EBIT. Okay. So therefore, because it's more forecast, and that's pretty true for just about any company you're going to look at, that the Ansel forecast operating profit more, that's the number we're going to use. So 16, or sorry, 16265. And operating profit to 19324. Okay, so those are the four minimal numbers. If you want to put in more years, you're welcome to. But as I said, we at least are going to use the first two years. All right? So what do we do now? Well, in our income tab, I'll shrink it to make it a little bit easier to see, we have a forecast for 2013 revenue in our model. And what we want is we want this number for the 2013 revenue in our model to be this number, which is the forecast from the earnings estimates. Except this cell is not yellow, which means I don't want to mess around with it because I can't directly change this. So where this cell is coming from is on the ratios, we have a percentage change that gets us to the 2013 revenue. So what I really want is I want to change the percentage change until I get the same 2013 revenue. Now, I have two ways to do it. I can iterate, and that could take a while, or I could just solve for it. So I'm going to do the solve for method. It'll be a little bit faster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for 2013, Percentage change is current year minus previous year divided by previous year. So for the 2013 percentage revenue growth rate equals left paren, current year for 2013 is the 2013 sales one. Minus previous year from the income tab, 2012 actual revenue, right paren, divided by 2012 actual revenue. So basically, if Google drops 5.4%, they match 
the 47446, 47446. So right now, the consensus in the market is Google's going to shrink next year by 5% in fiscal 2013. Where you see that? How I got to the negative percent? Do the same thing for 2014. So on the ratios tab, equals left paren from my assumptions, sales 2 minus sales 1, right paren divided by sales 1, then Google's expected to grow 16.6% the year after. Which means sales 2, 52, 50, sorry, 55,299. 55,299 is now in my model. All right? So I basically put in the next two years. By the way, in my ratios, we're now at a $1,400 share price. So we're getting a little closer. It's not growing 30% anymore. All right? So when we forecast, there's three critical things to forecast. On the ratios, it's a lot of ratios, but and we can change any one of these. What I want to tell you is, here's the 1090 rule. Here's the 10% of ratios that matter to 90% of your evaluation. One is revenue. Got to forecast revenue. That's why we forecasted that first. Two is margin. And what matters is no plat. Therefore, what matters is our forecast for operating income. Three is the tax rate, right under that. Well, for the revenue growth rate, we've put in the market revenue growth rate. For the tax rate, we need a representative tax rate. And when we started building the model, we used an average tax, tax rate the last six years. And right now, that's 22.9%. And as I look over these last six years, to me, that seems reasonable. So somewhere around a 23% tax rate probably seems reasonable for Google on a go-for go basis because for the last six years, they've been pretty close to that range. So I could change the tax rate if I wanted to, but what I'm trying to come up with is a reasonable tax rate, and the last six years average seems to me to be a reasonable assumption. So I'm going to assume that the tax rate stays at 22.9 forward. So the third number that's most important is to forecast the operating income. Now you'll notice that in our model, I can't directly forecast the operating income. It's in a white cell. So the way that I forecast the operating income is I have to change something above it. So I either change cost of revenue, or I changed operating expenses, or I changed depreciation and amortization. Some combination of those three will change my operating income. Now, here's the deal. Changing depreciation and amortization doesn't have much of an impact because depreciation and amortization is a non-cash item, and we're ultimately forecasting cash flow. So what really matters is my cash cost of goods sold and my operating expenses, also known as SG&As. Right. Now, in the real world, <clears throat> if I'm dealing with a company, I actually have to forecast both. I have to forecast their cost of goods sold, and I have to forecast their SG&A. But the model doesn't care. The model that we have built is based on operating income. And so what we're going to do for simplicity, and again, if you want to get more complex, feel free, but for simplicity, is we're just going to directly change one of the two, cost of revenue or operating expenses, rather than trying to change them both, because ultimately what we're really just trying to change is the operating income. So for simplicity, I'm going to choose to just change the cost of revenue. Okay, Because again, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to calculate a no-plat, and no-plat is based on the operating income after tax. And so therefore, I have to change the operating income, but I can't change it directly. So I'm changing the thing that drives it, in this case, the cost of the revenue. Again, I could explicitly forecast the two. And I'm telling you, if I talk to a CEO or a CFO, they're going to want to hear the explicit forecast of those two. But ultimately, for purposes of the model, the model doesn't care. The model's built off the operating income. So I'm going to use the proxy cost of revenue, excluding depreciation, as the change for driving operating income changes. So here's the deal. If I go back to my assumptions, then for forward year one, which is last reported year plus one, 2013, 
equals that plus 1. And 2014, I have the model, we'll call it the operating profit. That's already calculated for me on my ratios tab. From the ratios tab, 2013 operating income as a percentage of revenue and the 2014 operating income as a percentage of revenue. Format cells percentage two decimal places. That should be plenty. So right now the model is forecasting an operating profit of 25.43. The consensus operating profit we actually have equals the operating profit one divided by sales one equals the operating profit two divided by sales two that's what the analysts are predicting for operating profit for Google everybody see that so the model in the ratios is predicting this operating profit 25.4 and the consensus is predicting something much higher 16, 625 divided by 47 is closer to 34 percent so the, the, the market's actually predicting a much higher operating profit for the next couple of years for Google versus where they were historically make sense? questions about that? All right, so what do I need to do? Which one do I got to change? The cost of goods sold. So what I need to do is if my operating profit in the model is lower than what I need it to be, I need to reduce my cost of goods sold by basically that minus that. manual step. So what I'm going to do is 8.85% if I go into ratios subtract 0 0.0885 then there's no difference in the model from that consensus which basically means in my income tab for 2013 operating income 16265 16265 Right. By the way, for 2014, I need to reduce it another 0.66%. Minus point, or sorry, plus 0 0.0066. So theoretically, is that right? Sorry, I want more zero. Minus. There we go. Minus, not plus. That's okay. I reduce my cost, subtract. <laughs> Simple change. And now I've matched. So again, 19,324. Pretty close. 19,322. I'm going to call it close enough for rounding. Ever see what we just did? As I said, if I wanted to go the next couple of years, I could do so. But essentially, what I've done is I've now put in the first two years' worth of consensus. For now, I'm going to leave the balance sheet alone. <clears throat> I'm going to assume similar productivity in the future that they have in the past. But I could choose to change that as well. But as I said, initially, most of the value is going to really be these two major factors. Assuming we have a good tax rate, it's going to be the growth in sales and the margins, which are going to drive most of the cash flow. And if the sales grow, since everything here is a percentage of sales, so does the balance sheet, and so therefore does the CapEx and the, and the working capital. So as long as I assume constant productivity, as you grow, you're spending more money. You're reinvesting. So it kind of assumes a constant reinvestment rate. If you think the reinvestment rate is going to change, you could directly change the balance sheet. 
right? But at least for a simplistic point, let's try and figure out how do we get to 880 a share, which is about Google's current stock price, if we have to forecast in the future. Now, here's the thing. I don't think Google's going to keep growing at 16% a year. That's what the book said. The book said companies don't grow at these rates forever. Matter of fact, after five years, they tend to regress to the mean. Especially you get the law of large number effects. Because look at the size of Google. I mean, once you get to be essentially, excuse me, a $65 billion company, it's hard to keep growing 16% a year. That's what Apple's running into right now. Right? When you get to be $160 billion in sales, growing 20% is growing the equivalent of almost one Google a year from last year. That's hard to do. Right? So that's the point. It gets harder and harder as you become bigger and bigger. And so I know that eventually that growth rate is going to start to mature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start maturing the growth rate. So 2015, 10%. And I'm going to step it down. I don't believe in just lump steps. I think t companies tend to smooth things out over time. Now, by the way, this is where using something like IBIS World will help out or Hoover's. Because in the IBIS World report, they project out an industry growth rate for a decade. And so that'll give you a sense of what the market's going to grow over time. But I have a feeling it's going to be a lot lower. So let's go down to 6% and then 4%. And then remember, in terminal value, we're growing Google at 3% into the infinity. So I think that's reasonable. Now here's the thing. What I then want to do is I'm at $1,100 a share. I think that the cost of revenue is not going to be this low, by another way of saying, I think their operating margins are probably going to not stay at 35%. In fact, last year they went as low as 25%, and historically they've been in the low 30s. So what if this number, starting in 2015, started to go up? And why do you think I picked 2015? So when I adjusted the growth rate and these came from the analysts. So now I don't want to mess around with the first two years. All right. So I'm, I'm basically saying I believe that the market has a decent shot at getting it right for the next two years. So I'm starting with year three. So in this point. It's funny because um, I had, like I had the exact share price of year three. And then I looked at the Six. Oh, 2016 is 10 again. Yeah, and then 2017 and then 2020. Started ramping it down slowly rather than just arbitrarily jer jerking it down. And then here's the other part. I'm going to start raising it up a little bit. So instead of 25.7, what if it's 27? And instead of 27 by 2017, what if it's 28 or 29? And then what if by 2019, this number goes to 31? And then eventually 33. And let's make this 28. And let's make this 30. Sorry, I'm just, I'm trying to get this to 88, 880, which is where they are now. So just bear with me for a second. 30. Thanks. Close. Um. Uh, 36.2, 36, close enough, 30, uh, close, 
I'm at 877. So what I did, <clears throat> a lot of changes there, is I basically said that their cost of goods sold will go up, therefore their operating margin will fall somewhere into the mid-20s. So I raised the cost of goods sold to 30% for a couple years, 34% for a couple years, and then 35% into the future, 35-6. Yeah, I'm going to post this file, so you'll actually see this file in just a minute. But basically, I went from starting in 2015, 30 and 30, or 2015 and 2016, 2017 and 18, 34 and 34, 2019, 35, 6, and then just left to 35, 6 going forward. But what matters more is what I'm really saying is this 25% operating margin that they had last year is probably going back here, about the operating margin that the market must believe that they're going to get to long term if they have single digit growth rates to approximate the current share. That's what I'm trying to get. Now, I don't know if it's exactly these numbers. Like it could be a little bit more growth and a little bit less margin. It could be a little less growth, a little higher margin. But it, it starts to give me a feel for what the market's really keying in on with Google. And, and I think right now the market is expecting a short term surge in their profitability. But the market also probably doesn't think that that's going to last. And the reason why I don't think it's going to last is because the share price when we were in that margin range was eleven to twelve hundred dollars a share, not eight hundred and eighty dollars a share. The way you get back to eight eighty is you have to start bringing that margin back down. All right. And I can start to do some what if scenarios because I can do a what is a one percent change in price based on or sorry one percent change in revenue gives me this amount of price change. 1% change in margin gets me about this amount of price change, and I can start to understand the sensitivities. But what you have to establish, and this is going to frighten you, because in finance, we always assume there's a right answer. And what you really need to understand here is you're developing a range of possibilities. All right, so I don't know exactly what the growth is, and I don't know exactly what the margin is, but I start to, to believe that there's a reasonable range of growth in margin that explains the current share price. And that's really what I have to get comfortable with. And ultimately, what I'm getting comfortable with is, I think longer term, people are assuming Google's going to grow around 4 or 5% a year. And I think longer term, they think that the operating margin is going to trend back down to where it is now. All right, and, and again, that's what justifies the current stock price today at the cost of capital today, based on what Bloomberg is saying the cost of capital is. So those are going to be my primary cash flow drivers. And this is what I would call an as-is valuation. And so again, when we do the as-is, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what is that market point of view. We're trying to get very, very close to their share price to understand what's happening with their share price today. And again, 880 is where they closed on Friday. So technically, I'd like to get closer to 880, but 877, I'm going to call that close now. Now, for you, I'm going to make you get within a dollar. Because you're going to be looking at a company that is not an 880 share price. You're going to look at a company that has a lower share price, and so a dollar will make more of a difference. So a dollar is going to be your homework assignment. Yes? That's, that's, so that's model number two. So this is what we're calling your as-is valuation. And so the point of an as-is is, is you're trying to come up with an understanding of what are the assumptions that could lead to the current share price. What could the market be thinking to get to the current share price? And by the way, when I say what could the market be thinking, understand that one of the useful screens in Bloomberg is called HDS. It stands for holders. And this will tell you who owns Google stock. And basically, these 18 firms own 92% of Google. And this is now pretty typical of most U.S. companies, where you have fewer people owning the majority of shares. So the top 20 institutions probably own of the S&P 500. We could probably go in here and figure out the exact number, but probably own somewhere around 70% plus of the average S&P 500 company. And so the point is, these are the people that are determining the share prices. These institutions determine the share price of these companies. Every one of these institutional investors knows DCF. They have MBAs. They have masters. Some of them have PhDs. 
they've gone through these things, they use these formulas. And so again, whether we agree with it or not, this is the method that is being used out there to value companies. So really all we're doing is we're kind of replicating the models that already exist at these institutional firms. And we're just trying to get a sense of what type of assumptions are these people making that have the MBAs in finance, that have their DCF models, we're just backing into their models. All right? And they don't, and you see in the consensus, they don't all exactly agree, but we're just trying to get a sense of where the consensus is. Where's that average in the market? What is it looking like? What kind of revenue growth rates? What kind of markets can we get? Yes? So you're saying 92% of Google is owned by these 18 firms. Yeah, so I'm just telling you that these are the people that matter. Like if this company, Vanguard, which is probably just saying, hey, I'm going to own Google as part of my, you know, Vanguard diversified funds, a bunch of funds that Vanguard own them. If Vanguard decides to sell, and you can see what Vanguard's been doing. They've been buying. Green means buy. Very few of their institutional investors have been selling. Most of their institutional investors are buying. That's what's driving up Google stock price. You can see a direct relationship between all this buying in the last 30 days and the fact that this is one month of Google stock price. There's all that buying right there. It's been driving up the price. So it's the institutions that determine the share price. And if these institutions all decide to sell, then Google's going down. If they want to buy and nobody wants to sell, the price is going to go up. Supply and demand. And you can create short-term supply and demand issues with companies. That's why you get things like called a short squeeze. All the shorts got to cover, and there's not enough shares for them to cover their shorts. And then the price can spike in the short run because all the, the shorts are covering their shares. There's not enough shares to buy, and they have to buy into the market and make the price go higher. So that's when you get, for example, a short squeeze happen to a market. And by the way, <clears throat> this will lead me to my second tangent here, but I think the most dangerous stock to own today on the S&P 500 is Amazon. All right? Because I was thinking about making this your homework assignment, but it would be extremely difficult as your first homework assignment. And the reason why is because Amazon, same thing, which is controlled by these institutions, including Jeff Bezos, these 17 people in best Jeff Bezos own 92% of Amazon. So that's the same thing. Amazon extremely tightly held. Amazon share price is $280 a share. Amazon's market value is 100 and equity value today, $126 billion. But here's the thing. Amazon doesn't make any profits, and they have no free cash flow because they reinvest all of their depreciation plus more in building out Amazon Web Services. Like today, when I was driving here from Dulles Airport, I just saw there's a new building in uh, Reston. It's got Amazon Web Services name on it. I mean, they're just building these whole things all over the country. Their tech infrastructure and they're building their uh, warehouse infrastructure all over the world. And, and that's the point, is that they're not making any money. They're not generating any cash flow, yet they have a $123 billion market cap. It's all future. Right? And it's because these people on this screen believe in Jeff Bezos. And they believe that those cash flows eventually will justify that share price. So you can actually back into what those cash flows have to be in order to justify that share price. And Amazon's a lot harder to forecast because you have to go from a company that's not really making any money to forecasting what kind of profits justify that. And it starts to get really scary. So maybe I should make that to homework because it is hard to do. Right? People look at me like, no. Right. But but I think at some point this semester it might be easy. It might be one of the at least instructional even to do it in class because it gets back to if that perception ever changes, if these institutions ever start to feel that Amazon won't achieve those margins and cash flows, then Amazon is prime for a giant fall. It's not because they're a bad company, but their entire value is based on margins they've never achieved and that they have to achieve in the future that are very high in order to justify their current share price. You're betting extremely speculatively on that whole stock. And every quarter when Jeff Bezos reports losses and all the cash flows being plowed back in the business, these institutions have been patient. But if they ever run out of patience, then Amazon can fall really fast. Right? And I start worrying when I start to see some of these institutions sell.
There are more sellers here than buyers, big red sells. And if they start bailing out, then this is when Amazon really starts to drop. Right? But again, that's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do for Google. We're just trying to do the as-is valuation of Google. Right? So now I want to do what I'll call the final valuation of Google. So here's how we do the final valuation. So I'm going to save my as-is. File, save as, hyphen, final. Okay. So, I now have my final valuation. Here's the difference. <clears throat> I go back and I look at these numbers and I say, do I think they will be different? So, for example, if I believe that Google will continue growing at a faster rate than I did in the as is. So they're going to keep growing at 10% through 2019 and then 6% thereafter, as opposed to dropping to six and four, which I did in my as is. Then notice I'm at a $970 share price, almost $90 higher than I was today. Everybody see that? All right, let's say that that's the scenario I believe. <clears throat> We're going to use a rule that says plus or minus 10% of the existing share price is considered a hold. It's trading range. More than 10% is considered a buy. Less than 10% is considered a sell. So if I think that Google's really going to grow at this rate, and I disagree with the market, that they're just going to grow faster, right? because I believe that you know they're innovative, and they're going to come up with Google Glass and other wearable devices, and they're branching out into more and more revenue streams as a result of that, that that growth rate is not going to slow down and that they're going to use that level of innovation to maintain their market power, then I can make a story that says they grow faster with a little bit better margin. They're worth 97, 970 a share. That's more than 10% above the 880 today. So therefore, actually it's probably right around 10%. So here's the other thing I'm going to do. Cost of revenue, instead of going to 35.6, only goes to 35. So now I'm at 980 a share. So I'm more than 10% above my 880. I call it a buy. So this would be buy Google. And when you see a buy, what it's really saying is I think in present value there's more than 10% upside. All right. Then I could do a sell scenario. <clears throat> so I call that my sell, and I sell says, you know what? I think Google is going to start to really struggle. I think they're going to go from 10% to 5% to 3%. And I actually think their margins are going to get much worse, much faster. And I think this is going to go to 34. I think this is going to go to 36. And I think that this is going to approach 40. And I think that long term, their operating margins are going to be closer to 20%. And that, by the way, is 750, and that's a sell. Now I could make a case for either one, all right? And I can't tell you which of those is going to be true because we're predicting the future, all right? But when you do this, what I have to grade you on is can you create defensible assumptions? Can you tell a story? So you must craft a point of view. And the point of view needs to be fact based. Meaning you would have needed to have read the analyst reports. You would have needed to read the research reports on the industry. You need to educate yourself about the company and what's happening with that market and then justify your point of view. Now, I also mentioned that we created a graph. It's called the ROIC chart. <clears throat> the ROIC chart is our sanity check. We know that over time, ROICs tend to regress to the mean. This is Google's ROIC at a 750 share price. This is Google's ROIC at a 980 share price. That's the difference. If I believe they maintain their ROIC into the future, then I believe that Google's a buy. If I think that they regress to the mean or towards the mean in the future, then Google's a sell. Which one do I think is more likely?
because typically most companies tend to see regression towards the mean. So to me, that would say Google might be a little overpriced right now. And it's not because they're not going to do really well in the next two years. The analysts are predicting some phenomenal things for Google in the next two years. The challenge is what happens after that next two years. And what happens by the fact that everybody else is getting into the AdWord market, particularly Facebook, LinkedIn, and everybody else. They're going after some of that high margin business. And everybody else is doing wearable devices. Samsung's going to do wearable devices because they copy everybody. Apple's going to do wearable devices. So again, how profitable is that going to be? And is that really the next big thing? Yes. Well, the, the mean is not that they regress to. It's just we know that companies in general tend to regress towards the mean over time. That's what we, we read in the book, is that McKinsey showed us the graph, and I put in the lecture notes, of the compression to the mean of our OICs eventually. And so that's just the question is, what we're really saying here is if the industry gets tougher over time and returns start to go down, then Google has to increase its competitive advantage. They have to increase their dominance in order to maintain their ROICs in a tougher industry. And I'm not saying they can't do it because they're making a lot of investments, but that's the difference in point of view. I'm saying the difference in point of view of your view on Google's competitive advantage in the future is going to be the difference between a buy, sell, and hold. And so that's what you have to do. And this is art. This is not science. But it, so again, it's really just you take in a lot of data, more than just the numbers, and then you kind of infer your gut feeling about what you think these ratios are going to be. You have history, you have the analyst reports, you got some other people that you can follow, you got the industry research, and then you kind of put in your point of view. Yeah. So at the end of this book, I think you said like an ROIC is going to be like 50%. That's right. That's exactly right. We need to make sure that we see that good story because if we don't see that good story, then we're probably going to overvalue the company. Because the problem is that Apple 700 going even higher. Apple was the story of the ROIC chart heading continually up over time into the future. And I'm just telling you, that just doesn't happen. I mean, there are, maybe there's exceptions that will prove us wrong. But companies into the perpetuity generally don't go straight up with ROIC they tend to head towards maturity. Markets mature. Technology changes. You know, competitors adapt. Customers move on. And unless you have some sort of protective monopoly, it's hard to sustain that for long periods of time. And Google's got a monopoly because they're really good at what they do. But you know what? I was just reading yesterday that Yahoo finally killed off Alta Vista. And a decade ago, Alta Vista was the leading search engine until Google came around and completely changed that. And I'm not saying that Google's going to get replaced, but I'm saying at some point, <clears throat> 10 years from now, are they going to be making these margins and returns? That's the question. That's what we have to ask. And that's the buy, sell, hold. And so that's what you have to do. You have to kind of put, you, put your scenario in, put your numbers in, come up with that scenario. So this would have been the Google sell scenario. Actually, sorry, the Google buy scenario. And so I'll call this the... <clears throat> Final buy. Right, that's it. You're going to do two valuations.